Please. Please find another business. There is no other business. I know. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Congra congratulations on The Last Tycoon, this one of the most beautifully filmed television shows I think I've ever seen. It's it's unbelievably gorgeous. It, it, we had a great crew. I mean, let's just start with that. Kelsey, you've done a lot of television in your day. You've done a lot of movies. What was it like Why when not? you got to the set of this? Did you well, expect it to feel the way that it did and look the way that it did? When we walked uh, onto the first, uh, the first time I saw my office set, I thought, I could live here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is pretty nice, and I have done that in the past. <laughs> Rather than go home at all, I'd just sleep on a couch somewhere on a set. Did you sleep on but the Frasier set? Uh, I did all the time in my dressing room. Yeah, <laughs> just that I'm Amazing. not going home. Amazing. You know, so it was, it was, I had a pretty nice setup then, though. Not but, on the um, actual set. Not on the actual set. Like, you didn't wake up and John Mahoney was there, like, Kelsey, come on, let's get go. up. <laughs> <laughs> get up, it's time to get up. So, uh, but uh, it's, it's beautifully done and uh, well lit. And I, I was, we were talking just a minute ago. I, I saw the screening last night at the, the bottom of the hotel we're staying in, and I thought I was seeing, gonna see the second episode. I had seen the pilot before in sort of a smaller format, and uh, was, you know, yeah, it's, it's okay. But uh, on a big screen, it's, it's magnificent. Yeah. It's, it's, it looks fantastic. I can't imagine watching it on a handheld, although we want people to do that. But, uh, don't not do don't, that. Don't not watch it on a handheld. Just watch it any way you can, just watch yeah. it, all right? <laughs> but, uh, it's magnificent. And to get the real scope of how beautiful mm. it is, I think you really need to see see it on a big screen. Yeah, and it's not just the cinematography. It's the costumes. It's the hair and makeup. It's the, the people that are in it. Everyone's beautiful in it. And it has this incredible uh, sort of fantasy idea of the 1930s. You know, you feel like you're transported to the 30s, but also very much like the most pristine, beautiful version of the 30s possible. Yeah. It's fantastic. It, it has all the glamour you would expect. You know? I mean, we had a lot of the same crew um, as Mad Men. And so when you take that, they know what they're doing. They what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but also, it's, I think it's easy in a period piece to make it kind of caricature-y. And everyone on this um, crew are such geniuses at their work that they really, they make it period without making it jokey period. It's just so stunning to look at. But then at the same time, you know, the show deals with a lot of the dark underbelly of what's going on during the glitz and the glamour, too. So Although it's kind of got both. In my performance, I am sort of doing a combination of Daffy Duck and the Big Bad Wolf. So, <laughs> just Wait, so you know. Where does Daffy Duck come in? Do you remember the famous cartoon he runs around all the time? I think it was called like you know, Lost Gold Mines or whatever. <laughs> he, he's running around holding all the money, going mine, 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 mine. <laughs> so I think that's part of my character. It's a version of your. In, yeah, in the pilot, is. that's a version of your it character. It is. I'm the king well. around here, right? And now you two are uh, father and daughter in 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 the in show. In real life, and yeah. Yeah. wow. Shocker! <laughs> you, you took her other father's spot. Yeah. That's a tough shoe. Those are tough oh, shoes Phil and to I really, we really like each other. <laughs> uh, talk about your characters a little bit. Um, well, I play Celia Brady. She's a 19-year-old uh, college student who who leaves college to become a producer in the making, and she loves the show business world. Um, she's grown up in it, and she's choosing to kind of go about it her own way, taking her own path, and stepping outside her dad's shadow. And she's kind of the experimenter of the group, really. Um, a lot of things that happened in the 1930s that I wasn't aware of, my character gets to kind of play around in. And, like what? Uh, well, like, I can't tell you. you got to watch <laughs> the series. Oh, yeah. well, can you talk about, um, know, like, what's in the pilot? I mean, uh, her, her pitch near the... Yeah, near I mean, it, it's, it was... Uh, you know, quite rare um, for, for females to kind of put themselves out there and pitch ideas back then and, and to start from the ground up in that in behind the camera sort of world. And, and Celia has an idea for a movie and she wants to, she wants, she's 19, so she's also young and a woman. So she kind of had two things going against her. Um, and so she's kind of at the forefront of, of women really going after that side of things in the show business and um, that and some cool awakening first experiences that she has during the show it was really fun to play. 
I love the presentation in the pilot, the presentation of uh, Hollywood's relationship with with Germany and the and the and the Third Reich and how they were sort of unwilling to actually throw them under the bus or call them out because they actually had a financial stake in showing their movies over there, which is something that Hollywood I think rarely talks about when they talk. About, Hollywood always likes to pretend it's at the forefront of, of of culture and liberalism, but it is still a part of commerce, and sometimes it has to make decisions like that. What was it like to sort of dive into that story? Well, you know, it just it just is it's obvious. It's, it's not really a, 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 a head scratcher. You, you you realize they needed to have income in order to make movies, and Germany was a huge revenue stream. They loved movies. Uh, I guess it was probably England. Excuse me, um, Germany and uh, the U.S. that were its big, biggest audience. They, they say it's it's our second largest foreign uh, audience, and. Uh, you just don't throw away money like that. And for, as far as they were concerned, you know, why, why mess around with the social uh, engineering of, uh, of the Nazi movement until, of course, it became untenable. Yeah. But uh, the extraordinary thing was that most of the guys that were the heads of studios were Jewish. And, um, and they knew when this Article 15 came around, and it was, it was the real deal, it's, it's in a historical fact, uh, that Article 15, you know, limited participation even by Jews in foreign offices uh, held by studios. And they were just had to be fired, and they went along with it. So you know, clearly the writing was on the wall, but nobody really wanted to read. So it's okay. You know, it's, you look back on it and think, well, you know, it's it's a page in our history that maybe we're not proud of, but we do the same thing now. You know, I mean, the China the Chinese market dictates uh, a lot of things about what they're willing to let us release in their country, and you know, that's the way it is. And we still make those movies. You were in Transformers 4, you know. Transformers <laughs> Fair 4. About the Chinese well, Transformers. Mark. Was I in 3 or 4? I don't even remember. But, um, I think 4. Right, they killed four, me. With I was, Wahlberg, I was right? the first human being ever killed by Optimus Prime. <laughs> and that's, oh, yeah. that's quite a distinction. So I must have been a that's real the coolest jerk. IMDb credit yeah, ever, I think. Right. That, that, <laughs> but, uh, that actually reminds me, Kelsey, and we're, we're going to stick to The Last Tycoon, but nobody is allowed to get off this stage if they've worked with Michael Bay without it, you know, telling me what it was like. Well, I love with Michael, Michael Bay. Bay. I, I absolutely love him. But... Uh, in, the, in, the, in my particular character, I, I geared my entire performance toward this one, you know, sort of pinnacle when he finally just lost it. Because he's cool as ice until he finally just blows and he's out, you know, he pulls his gun out and he goes. And uh, it was, he took a driver that was driving too slow and grabbed him and opened the door and threw him out of the driver's seat. And then the, he got run over in a tunnel subsequent. And, and because he was Chinese, that part of my performance was cut. So what for me was my big moment was, damn it! <laughs> and so I, I, it still sort of worked, but I did that that climax didn't happen. Just, did did, uh, did Michael Bay ever curse you out? No, no. Oh, we, okay. We were like this. <laughs> <laughs> he just does it for effect. Well, that's Michael Bay. It's just, he just wants to get people's attention, get them on the same page. You know, you got 150 people standing around, kind of doing something. Somebody's got to, you know, kick it in gear. I never hold it against them. They're just wonderful stories when they're, <laughs> done, they're told on it's the great. stage. Uh, so the last I could, the you know F. Scott Fitzgerald's book. It's a it's somewhat of a controversial book. It was po published posthumously, and uh, there's been other versions that have been published of it because it, it wasn't quite done. Right, the the book wasn't quite done. Yeah, I mean he passed away before he finished it, but there's a rendition of it that you can get that at the end it has. Um, because I guess he had notes of where he wanted the characters to end up and where he wanted them to go. So you find out where he wanted Celia to end up and all the characters. But um, it's quite interesting to read something after someone's passed away of where their intentions of a character was going and where they ended up only getting or reaching. So it's kind of a great opportunity to take a book like that and make it into a show because you, you know, in our, our pilot basically deals with the book and then it just goes off and, and you kind of have liberties to expand like just upon. setting the stage for the world. Yeah, yeah. and then we have we have Scott Berg and um, historians that are on board as well with our crew that are are making the show historically factual as well as you know beautiful, and we can kind of go off and and, and tell stories like we do in the movie business. Yeah. But it's sort of like tipping a hat to to Fitzgerald's language. Yeah, paying tribute honestly. and. Yeah, and off you go. Yeah. It's, it's really convenient that he didn't finish it, so you know, <laughs> we can sort of do what we want to. Say, yeah, this is where he would have gone. This, Who knows? We, this, this is, is, this is great. Uh, now, 
Bomer's character in the book is based off of the legendary producer Irving Thalberg. Uh, I'm not sure, is Celia based off of anyone or influenced by anyone? Did um, you look at any well, sort of female, were there any female producers of that time that you could that you could look towards? Well, I think like, you know, Sherry Lansing um, was, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously didn't, Celia is not based on her, but that idea of, of, of a female going after, you know, something that, like Amy Pascal or something, yeah. Exactly, like an Amy Pascal. Yeah, I mean, she, she, you know, hopefully we get to do multiple seasons because Billy, has our showrunner and writer, uh, creator, has has expanded upon to me where hopefully Celia ends up, and it's very exciting for a female to get to do what Celia gets to do. But, um, yeah, she's just kind of not based on someone particular, but I was heavily inspired by women like that who have, you know, kind of been at the forefront of of females in the business. Sort of, yeah, and pushed ahead in, in a male-dominated yeah. field and pushed exactly. ahead against a male-dominated yeah. field. Kelsey, did you base your character off of any sort of studio executives of that time or studio executives that you've had run-ins with? A couple of inspirations. I, I, I don't actually know anybody that behaves this way, honestly. If they do, they've never shown it to me. So <laughs> I, I just... But I, I carry on my life and my career sort of on the outskirts of the industry. I always have. I don't really like to get too involved. So I'm a bit of an outsider, and I always have been. So I'm happy happy with that in my life. Uh, I read a book, King Cone, that uh, Billy Ray had pointed out to me that I thought gave me a couple of ideas. He's a bit of a tough. He's he's a, a tough guy. He knows how to hurt people if he wanted to, uh, and I, I I drew from that a little bit. And also, he has a kind of a an accent that comes out once in a while, like he thinks he's a gangster. Well, there's such an interesting line he has in the in the first in the pilot episode where he says, uh, "Did you live on the streets?" And the guy says, yeah. "I lived on the streets at one point." He says, "I think it actually it toughens builds character." You up, builds character. Right, yeah. And that is such a sort of particular line when it comes to people of wealth of that time, because so often they were actually self-made men. The American dream is that. I mean, you yeah. know, you get from the streets and you get to somewhere else. You know, it's so it really it sort of builds this idea of your character that he he just can't be soft with with anyone, right? Exactly. Well, it's, you know, you have this wonderful scene where you're dealing with people on the streets and a bit of heart comes out of him. What was it like playing that scene? Well, that's a, that's a great scene to me. I mean, Billy, Billy had said uh, before we shot that scene, he said, well, I, you know, I want you to pull out some money and, you know, put it, put it in a hat. So I thought, well, all right. So that's when I got out of the car and I thought, they won't understand what I'm doing unless I show them the money. So I, I, I just held it in the air for a minute. And uh, Billy came over and said, oh, boy, I love that. I love that thing. You know, just held it in the air like that. This is what I can do. This is, this is what I can do to kind of redeem my sense of caring for people. And then he puts the money down on the, in the hat and then walks away. And then finally gives the kid a job and then spits at him to make it look like he didn't do anything nice for him. Because <laughs> he is one tough guy. <laughs> and, and he doesn't want anybody thinking he isn't who he is. He doesn't want, to, doesn't want anybody to see the, the sort of a, you know, a, a weakness in any way. Do you think that holding the money in the air, well, while, while, as you said, it was a, a practical thing to sort of let the audience know that, you know, what you were doing is also an element of while he's being nice, still sort of maintaining a kind of like king image of this is my money. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's an interesting guy to play. I mean, it's really fun. What, what develops throughout the rest of the season uh, is his discovery that he cares more deeply about things than he realized and kind of trying to figure out what kind of man he is. And, you know, it's not the principal storyline, but it is what gives him some color and some character. And now, obviously, he has some issues with uh, with your character, Celia, sort of becoming a producer and getting involved in the industry. Uh, is, can you talk about how that sort of plays out over the course of the season without giving Yeah, well, advice? I mean, Celia is so much like her dad in that she's very passionate, tenacious, you know, sometimes stubborn in that she goes after what she wants and she kind of won't let anyone really deviate her plan. She clearly wants to prove something. She re yeah, yeah, I think she wants to step outside the shadow of her dad and 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 make other people realize that she's doing this because she wants to and isn't just going to get there because of her name. Um, they love each other so much mm -hmm. and, and they give each other a hard time, but at the end of the day, they're always going to have each other's back. But throughout the season, you'll have to just see where things end up between the two of them. And it's a, it's a very interesting kind of well, no, very relatable father-daughter relationship, yeah. but also it's heightened because it's in the business and it's during that time period where women and, like I said, a 19-year-old young girl um, wouldn't really be doing what she's doing. So it's there's a lot kind of going on within that relationship. But it was so fun yeah, to play. It's too. really fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Because I, on the bottom line is he just adores her and there's nothing she can do that really is wrong. <laughs> but 
<laughs> There's one point when I think I turn to you and say, I'm gonna kill you too. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, it's he like so, you know, so father daughter yeah. thing. And he'll like lay into her. Then my little girl was on the set at one point. We were doing a scene and I, I, I really lit into, into uh, Celia. And uh, <laughs> she, she came up to me, she's five, and she said, Dad, why were you yelling at that princess? It was the cutest thing. <laughs> so I thought, sweet. Yeah, I'm sorry, honey. It's just written in the show. It said, I hope you don't ever talk to me that way. I said, well, you know, we'll see. <laughs> uh, maybe when, when you're 13, 14, we'll yeah. talk about but it. Uh, By the end of season five, you know, if we're so lucky to be there, she'll still be, be on the, the set show. and she'll be, she'll be schooling she'll be all directing. of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, now I have to ask before we go to audience questions. We didn't talk about Matt Bomer, who is uh, you know the we? main character. I know why would we talk about this man? <laughs> now uh, I am not a gay man, but I've interviewed Matt Bomer, and I spent the majority of the interview just looking at his face, going, yeah. "How is that a real face? What is this yeah. cut from the gods? What is this? What is what is it like acting with that?" Well, I'm <laughs> what is I'm it like? Serious? I could it barely get through an interview move. with him one time. Um, what's well, great? Because Celia is enamored with 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 <laughs> Monroe Star, and I'm enamored with Matt Bomer. So, um, you know, I I I think Very Celia. Nice man as well. Uh, yeah. By the way, when you have someone on set who's setting the tone that is the most zen, easygoing, respectful, um, conscientious person, it sets the tone for the entire cast and crew for the for for the whole season. And uh, he's just so aware of everything around him and takes the job so seriously and makes you feel so comfortable um, and just really fun. So it was it was great to work with him and he embodies Monroe Star so perfectly. I mean, he is so infectious and effervescent and, and so is Monroe Star. So it was a piece of cake working with Matt, yeah. always. He's lovely, yeah. I mean, lovely guy, terrific fella. I mean, and, 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 they, and he's, yeah. he's really good in the role, honestly. It's yeah. really, really interesting. It's a kind of... That sort of sculpted, um, impossibly good-looking guy is, is really interesting to play. It, it grants him a kind of an aloofness, and people, you know, step away from him. It's it's a really interesting thing for his character. But that aloofness is also a wonderful gateway for the audience. It's, it's, it's how yeah. it's how the audience Perfect. sort of is able to put all of their impressions onto that that absolutely that actor. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah. And my my guy just envies him, you know, because if he kind of created him. But he hired him because he knew he had an eye for something that I didn't have, that my guy didn't have. So you're going to become like a Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, yeah. Point, well, right? absolutely. Yeah, but still, it's a it's a great symbiotic and and uh, at loggerheads kind of relationship. Um, we explore a lot of it, a lot of conflict, a lot of fun. Let's get some questions uh, from the audience. Who you have a microphone? I'm assuming that's a question. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hi. Great. How are you? I'm good. My question for you is: Is there a scene while filming that you particularly loved, or a scene that you think the audience is going to love while watching this? Well, yeah, I hope there's many. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, you don't watch ten episodes. Like, I know. I'm like, <laughs> let me think of one that I liked. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff with my character and Fritz Lang. Which, uh, yeah, which I can't go into, but um, that's when I was talking about things I didn't really know were big in the 1930s. Um, my character gets to go through a lot of experimental stages in growing up as a young woman, especially in the business, and Fritz Lang is a bit of a gateway to some of that. And um, it's an interesting relationship throughout. The, I'm, yeah. I'm not thrilled about her spending any time near <laughs> Fritz Lang for a lot of obvious reasons. Oh, I can't uh, wait. I can't oh, yeah, wait no, it's, it's, uh, he, he says straight out what he thinks of Fritz Lang. And it's <laughs> that's one of my favorite moments is when he's first pitching us the movie that yeah. you, yeah. yeah. And I just sort of turn and you go, okay. And I give you the dad. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know. No. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, listen, what's fun about this situation right now is by Monday, we can tell you everything because <laughs> it's all out There's on so Friday. Many that we want to like that, <laughs> so I can't go there. Yeah, no, it's yeah. like, but after a weekend or so, yeah, we can all talk about we'll everything. Come back here on Monday, and, and then, then you can, can tell us what you thought everything. your favorites yeah. were. Yeah. Are there any other um, famous directors or producers that your characters engage with uh, in the in the first season outside of Fritz Lang? There's, you know, there's a, f a few famous people. There's, well, with Louis B. Mayer is yeah, Louis B. Part. Mayer's there, and Marlena and, uh, Dietrich, Marlena Dietrich, Fritz Lang. Uh, that sort of stops there for this year, but I think they're they're talking about uh, a, f a few other like appearances. Well, Hedda Hopper's in the in the show. Oh yeah, super famous, yeah. You know, uh, gossip columnist and uh, is it Kill Gallant too? Was she then? 
She was uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, I think. She was I don't know, yeah. one of the gals. Oh, well, Jennifer well, Beals. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Beals plays a movie star. Yeah. But it, it, that's based on. Which is on based something. on a yeah, bunch of different of a, people. A few ideas. Yeah. A lot of the characters are also based on like amalgamation yeah. of, and, of people yeah. we know. Jennifer Beals is fantastic in it. Yeah. I mean, just wonderful. Whoa. Hi. Hey. Whoa. Hey. Whoa. We're going to take our next question from our Tumblr. So, Diana would like to know how do you relate to your characters in The Last Tycoon and how do you differ? Well. Oh. Well, I'm a miserable prick. <laughs> uh, so that part's easy, and then uh, the rest of it's finding the heart that's the issue. Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to be like Celia in that when I was 16, I'd walk into boardrooms of executives at networks trying to pitch talk show ideas, and I felt very much like uh, Celia. You know, Wait, in that whoa, 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 whoa. What, what was your talk show idea? I wanted to, to do a young The View. I wanted it to be all teenagers, and I wanted to have like a talk show that teenager were, teenagers were doing. But I was told by everybody that I went to the room with that there was no audience for that. The, the problem was that she showed up and said, and I am Barbara Walters. I wanted to be a mixture <laughs> between Barbara Walters, Ellen, and Tyra. There you go. I, I don't, didn't, no one bought it. That's why they um, couldn't buy it. That's they why they couldn't buy it. We have no idea what Three famous doing. people on television. Right. Yeah. <laughs> make, it, make it happen. Um, no, so I was very tenacious and spunky and, and, and passionate um, and uh, also very naive, like, like Celia. And I differ from her because I didn't, don't get to wear as many cool hats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Celia and I are very similar in, in a lot of ways. Lily's terrific in this part. Thank you. She's lovely in it. Brilliant. I do have time for one more question. Hi, back here. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, so I want to know, like, what the different, like, in your opinion, like, the contrast and, like, the similarities between 1930s Hollywood and Hollywood now, and if you have any advice for people who want to be in Hollywood. That's me, by the way. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's probably pretty similar, honestly. I mean, they're... The, the issue is you only have so many stories you can really tell. I mean, there's, you know, scripts are pretty much always the same. Some are great, some aren't. You hope for good writing, and that's all possible. We've got some terrific writers on this show. But in Hollywood, it's, you know, humans are basically used as, as an, an asset. Or, you know, uh, how's your following on this or that? It hasn't really changed much. I mean, how's their box office, what it used to be now? It's, you know, how many followers do they have on this? this outlet or, or another, or this bit of social media, there's, you have something to sell, and, and that is your personality or your, 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 what you present as a, as a human being. Young women, unfortunately, young women don't stay young women. So, you know, hopefully you have the ability to, to remain in some sort of an ascendant path as you age and become an interesting, you know, human being, rather than just a beautiful young person. Uh, it's pretty much the same for men, too. And you hope that the, the industry will allow you to grow with it. Uh, often that's not the case, and it's a pretty cruel world to live in. I don't think that's changed. I always looked at Hollywood out my office window, and I would say, it's a, a barren landscape of despair. <laughs> there, are, there are some really hard, hard stories that are told every day, every year, from the, from the inception of the, the idea of Hollywood to this very day, and I don't think they're different at all. And you have to be a tough son of a gun to make it, even as an actor. Yeah, and I was gonna say, like, advice-wise, it kind of goes along with that, but if I could count the amount of times I was told no, yeah. it would amount to, I mean, just, it was way too many times. And it made being told yes that much better. And so I created the mentality in my head of taking no as no, not right now, not no, this isn't for you. So no didn't have a period, it had a dot, dot, dot. And so if I had given up after the first time I had said no, I wouldn't be here. And so it just, you know, not letting someone dictate your future. If you believe in something so strongly and you want to do something so strongly, who's going to tell you to not do it? So that was adapting that kind of allowed me to take a lot of pressure off, too. There's also probably no better place to spend to explore your own tenacity and your grit and your stick to itiveness. And these are things that are what drive the American dream. I mean, honestly. It's got nothing to do with anybody giving it to you. The American dream is something you have to go get, and you shape it on your own, and Hollywood is probably the best place to try that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, guys, The Last Tycoon uh, starts streaming uh, this Friday, yes. right? Yeah. On Amazon Prime, all episodes. Is it two Days episodes? away. Uh, two days away, yeah. Two everything. days away. 
pilot to the last episode. Nine like said, episodes. Monday, we all come back and we talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around for Monday. Hopefully, exactly. you've seen the show. It's so beautiful. It's a wonderful show. Congratulations, guys. Thank Kelsey Grammer and Lily Collins. Thank, Thank you. you.